So I want to tell you a little bit about corporate storytelling and how that operates and how to talk to investors. The first key point is you, you want to make sure you're not intimidated because a lot of you are. When you get up on stage, you feel like you're being judged. You, you, have, to, you have to have a discussion more like you're a partner rather than you're asking for money. You, you see the difference? You have to position yourself in the way that I'm doing this. This is you're, you're doing them a favor. You get the positioning, so you're actually doing them a favor, not they're doing you a favor. Because you, what you're doing is you're giving them an opportunity to make a lot of money. Because obviously you believe in your product, you believe in your startup, you know that you're going to make a lot of money. Because if you don't, then it's you, oh, it's over right there. But if you know that you're going to make a lot of money, then you're doing them, you know, giving them an opportunity to make a lot of money. The second key thing is the storytelling part, which is I think missing from everybody from I saw today. Everybody, nobody knows how to do storytelling. Nobody. Those pitches that you guys prepare, it's very robotic. You know what I mean? Have you seen the pitches? You've done pitches to each other as well, I'm sure. You just stand there and go, oh, do, 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 do. It's, it's super robotic and it's very unorganic. Hey, Berge. How are you? Good, how are you? Great. Um, I, Berge's son and I grew up together in Boston, basically. <laughs> <laughs> That's where no Berge from. Um, so it's very robotic. You're just kind of reading off the list of things that you want to mention and Oh, hello. Well, I'm da da da. And then, and then you have this thing where you kind of pass it to your friend and then he passes it back, but it's just very awkward and it's very unorganic. And so if you're, who's, who's on, who's pitching? One, two, three, eight, ten people. Two should be enough. If you're three, four, five, you're already too many in my opinion. Two is the maximum. And even if you're two people, you got to figure out your roles. Who's doing what, why, how that operates. Because you're just kind of standing there and you're reading off again. You, you've prepared something beforehand. And you're just going through the motions of saying the words that you prepared. But what you're not doing is you're not reading the room. You're not reading the room. The people sitting there are the people you need to engage. And you're not engaging them whatsoever. And you give like the little cards that you think that, or you give them the app and you're like, here, why don't you just play around with it a little bit. But you're not actually engaging the room whatsoever. You need to engage the room better. Uh, and how to do that is you want to make sure that you know, even if you prepare the pitch, that pitch has to be fluid. It has to be a situation where you, you change pitch, you change, your, change the discussion, stop the pitch. If you see that the person in front of you isn't engaging, stop. Because whatever you're doing isn't working. Does that make sense? No? Kind of? Quasi, you can talk. By the way, <laughs> you're just frozen. <laughs> well, I mean, I suppose part of intimidation comes in by the lack of time. Uh, so but that shouldn't be intimidating. It's the, it's the. See, ninety-five percent of success is the preparation for the pitch. Truly, the pitch itself is completely secondary. If you're, if you're really prepared, you know your product. You know the key points. And it should be two, three key points. There should be no more than that. Because if you go more, if you make it too complex, it's not understandable. I mean, you can basically say, we are Uber, we are blah, blah car, but dot, dot, dot. That's the, the whole pitch. You don't need anything more than that because you're assuming the guy in front of you knows blah, blah car is. If they don't, they're probably not your investor anyway. And the majority of them are going to know because they're VCs and, they're, and they know blah, blah car. And blah, car went through the whole round one, round two, financing, etc. So you shouldn't have a problem there. But you need to engage because what you do is you, you get to a point where the, the people sitting in the panel is half asleep. They're kind of dozing off or they're in their phone or they're disengaged, but you're just continuing the same pitch. And I don't understand why, why that would ever happen ever. Because you need to stop and actually engage. It's, it's preparation. And what I mean by preparation is you need to prep on who you're talking to. The level of detail that you need to go into, and this is crucial, and I have multiple examples of this, uh, consulting firms that we worked at. We went to Davos with the Prime Minister. The preparation is so detailed, so detailed. We knew that we were meeting an, an Egyptian investor, multi-billionaire. I knew that his daughter just graduated from Yale. You have to have a dossier on who you're talking to, and you might not use it, but you might use it. But this is information you need to have because it's information that engages. Because when I see that he's dozing off, I say, oh, I heard your daughter just graduated from Yale. Congratulations. And he's engaged. Automatically, he's engaged. And, you know, Arab country, he's Arab. 
So family is important, family values are important. So when I talk about his daughter, understandably, I'm gonna get engagement automatically, right? They're human beings. Business decisions don't exist, in my opinion. And this is, this is our philosophy of our consulting firm, and we've been operating like that forever, and it works. Business decisions don't, don't exist. The, the emotional level that you need to engage with is crucial. If you don't engage emotionally, the functionality isn't gonna matter. Because the person sitting in front of you has seen 15,000 pitches in the past five years, right? Right? And you can't differentiate it functionally. They've seen a thousand blah blah cars, they've seen a thousand. They say if you, if you have an idea, there's at least a thousand people that have the same idea in the world. A hundred of them have actually acted on it. Ten of them are up and running and one of them is a successful business. So there's no, you really, if, you, if you're going on the new, this is new, you're gonna lose. It's not, it's not that. You have to make sure you engage on the emotional level. Know your audience, know who you're talking to and prepare. Because if you're prepared 100% for anything, for any scenario, then on the spot, you can actually start switching your scenario, switching your pitches. Uh, if it's two people, what we usually do with his two people is we say there's, uh, there's somebody that does play-by-play, -play, like sports commentary. If you watch any sports commentary, there's two people that are commentating. One person is doing the play-by-play, -play, right? This guy passed to that guy, that guy passed to that guy. And the second one's doing color commentary. He's giving statistics, he's giving information. Well, this person got transferred for this, for this much money, and he's making it colorful, right? The storyline. And if there's two people, that's what you should be doing. Somebody should have their eye on the time. And they're moving through the motion of explaining what the product is, what the pitch line is. And the second one then jumps in, does... Oh, by the way, oh, we last time we said this, this is what happened. And it's just a story about, like an anecdotal story about, but it gives information and value to the product that you're trying to push. Those are the things that engages. Those are the things that make what you do and what how you pitch, not just a pitch, but an actual story. It's something that you give, it's something that you say. A lot of the time, the startups will start with how they came up with the idea as the storytelling. But even then, it's such a prepared line that it looks like it's fake. It looks unorganic, it doesn't look real, it's not, it's not comfortable, it's not straightforward, it's just kind of robotic again, that, 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 you know what I mean? So it's not, uh, it's not there. What do you think? I agree, I mean, I suppose one of the uh, best options generally if you imagine yourself in the position of the investor, you're talking to, uh, if you, I mean, you go through what you, what you really want to say, and imagine like, that's a person telling you that, I mean, sometimes uh, this goes. This comes good in the practice because, like, sometimes I'll be practicing a speech or something, and I ask myself, like, if someone told me that, would I actually be interested? Like, probably not. And that would change the subject completely. Right? That's one of the options that we. Uh, it's it's yes and no, because yes, but the no is that. You, do you have kids? No. So obviously, you're never going to talk about kids, right? But if the person in front of you has two kids, that might be a topic you want to bring up. You get what I mean? So it's, you have to put yourself in the shoes of your target audience, but you have to know your target audience to do that. And that includes family, that includes personal and professional background. So you understand how to engage, what to engage, and what are the topics that, you know, we call them tension points. And, and a lot of the time, a lot of the time, the wow factor, you, you want to have a wow factor, understandably, throughout. You want to have one point that is going to go wow. And it's just going to stop them in their tracks. A lot of the time, the wow factor is... A lot of the time the wow factor is just, st it stops. It's something that you just say, no, I don't agree, or you push it back and it just creates, what do you mean, you don't agree with me? I'm the investor, you know, that kind of thing, right? Um, should we say hello to Mr. Avignon? Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Avignon. Hello, Mr. Avignon, how are you? <laughs> I think, should we or should we not? Thank you. <laughs> so what were you saying? Uh, so essentially, uh, I would say, uh, pro, uh, probably one of the best options would be, uh, as for, my, uh, for my personal experience, the short time I had, is to imagine ourselves in the position in the shoes of the investor. So as long as yeah. you can uh, engage with yourself, uh, put them in your shoes and think, is whatever I'm saying right now in uh, something that I'd be interested in, 
then I, I think that's the point where you realize it's worth to continue with that line. Unless it's not, that's the way you, that's the point you have to stop at. Uh, but the question comes in, like, how much can you actually engage a person with? I mean, there has to be a limit to that. Why? The kids is a good example. I mean, I would not be able to talk with them about kids. You wouldn't because you don't have credibility. Exactly. You have to talk to them in, the, in a sector that's interesting for them, but you also have credibility in discussing. Understand if you're not a parent, you can't talk about kids. Because if you talk about kids, my first question is going to be, do you have kids? You're going to say no, and you lose all credibility. But you have to find the, the niche area that you have credibility in. So what are areas that you have credibility in? What's your background? Well, I'm a graduate from the University of York in the UK. OK. Uh, so that's one of the things. Maybe uh, Russell Group graduate studied in the UK, maybe. OK. If I'm from Georgia, if okay. I'm uh, in the business sector generally, maybe if, I, if someone is related to politics field, because I'm a bachelor in politics. OK. Uh, there you go. Perfect. Perfect. So I'll give you a good example. The, if you've done background research on me, for example, you would find that I was in politics on a certain level. So if you engage with me uh, with a geopolitical topic, it's something that you have credibility in, you know, and something that I can engage with. Now, there was three people on the panel, so you have to make sure you balance it out. But you want to make sure that ultimately you have to understand that investors are human beings. It's like when you're, when you're in school, you think that the teacher doesn't poop, right? It's normal when you're you know, eight, nine years old, you think the teacher's not a human being. They're the teacher, they don't poop. And then when you find out that that's not true, it blows your mind that, oh my God, they're human beings. They actually go home, they make food, they eat, they do all the things that you do and it blows your mind. That's what you have to make sure, that's what I'm talking about intimidation. The investor is a human being. They have emotions. They have all. They go through all the the normal human emotions, that interactions. They like to go out and have fun. They like to spend time with the kids. They like to, you know, have beers with their pals. It's, they're they're humans. And if you can bring them to that human level and talk to them as humans, it's easier to engage. But in order to do that, again, you have to do your preparation. So the preparation is going to be going to be crucial for that. Okay. Um, I, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Yep. What are the three things that you're mentioning? Yeah. Armenia, okay. And what is the story that you're telling? Good. Armenia? Good. You good. Armenia. What's the Armenian story? That's a good question. So what I what I usually say is uh, Armenia has two I have two lines of pitches. One is more the functional line and I have one that's more the emotional line, right? And they kind of link together at the end. Uh, the emotional line is very straightforward. What I say is the following. I say, okay, so when I say Armenia, what's your first reaction as an investor? Right? They don't know where Armenia is, they have no idea. I say, what, Armenia? I say, Armenia. They go, Albania? I go, no, 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 Armenia, right? Yeah, is... So you still have that, you know, Romania? No, 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 Armenia. So you have that, they don't have no idea what we're talking about. So but the problem is that as soon as I say Armenia, and they're thinking Albania or Romania or some sort of reference point, in their head, they have a, an 80-year-old guy sitting on a donkey in the villages. That's the picture they have in their head about Armenia. So whatever I do after that is not going to work. If I say, well, there's opportunities in the IT sector, it's a clash in their head. So first of all, I have to change the picture in their mind of what Armenia is before I can pitch any sector, or industry, or project. So what I say is, okay, listen. So Armenia, for example, I would say, Armenia is a country where, uh, is one of the only countries on earth that has chess as a curriculum. It already changes that visual in their head of the donkey, is already shifts. You see what I mean? And I say, well, Armenia, we're, we're the country, we're the nation that gave the world the MRI machine, the ATM machine, the green dollar color, the color TV, uh, the oxygen mask for airplanes, and so on and so forth. And there's a million things that I can say. And I say, if, if Germans are engineers and Italians are designers, then Armenians are creators. It's what we do. We create things. We make the human life better. You have my investment. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Avinian. <laughs> so that's sort of the pitch line I take on that. And then I and I and then from that you plug in oh Alec. Alec, how are you, Alec? You wanna join? No, no, I'm missing, I'm enjoying. All right, all right. So uh, so from, from there I take the functional line, right? Now that I have that visual set that we are creators, we are that. The, the donkey is not there anymore, then I say, listen, Armenia is the only country on earth, the only country on earth that's part of the Eurasian Economic Union. We have a GSP plus regime with Europe and we have a border and a free trade agreement with Iran. 
So we are the only country on earth that connects those three, anyone with anyone. So we're the perfect hub to access to 800 million market without customs or with preferential custom regime. And that's the function that I shove underneath it. So I gave them the reason why to love Armenia, I changed the picture, and then I'm giving them a functional reason why to be interested. After that, I start asking questions. What sector are you interested in? What business do you do? And I start getting them engaged. Because I already got their interest. That one minute pitch is enough for them to shift their mind about Armenia and get them interested. Then it's all about engaging on a one-to-one -one contact level and asking them you know, what industry they're interested in, where they want to invest, and what they want to do. It's a, but it's very quick, you know what I mean? It'll take me a minute and a half, so three minutes is not a problem. In a minute and a half, I can change their mind from a, a guy and a donkey to Armenia's creators. And from that point on, it's easy, sell, it's easy selling from there. Make sense? Questions? Guys? If it's Anybody? Such an easy sell, how come yeah. we're not more successful? I, that's a very good question. That's the easy sell when it comes to the sales process. When it comes to the end game, when you, they want to actually put money, then they, of course, every business has risks and they want to calculate their business risks. The first problem, and I can tell you the, the problems that we usually get with investors, the first problem, and understandably, is Armenia is landlocked with closed borders. So it's automatic that the first reaction of, especially. Well, that's not how I, I put it, but yeah, that's how they think about it. Uh, they Even if they're, you know, an American investor sitting in Texas, he, he Googles Armenia. All he sees is genocide and war. And so the content that he's getting is already, you know, going against us. That's the one problem. The second problem is um, um, it's more uh, functional because they're looking for, if when we say that we want investors to come to Armenia, the best investor for Armenia as a country is an investor that's willing to put longer term capital, right? But understandably, because of the political risks, the, the war, all that stuff that's happening around, they're, in print, they're looking for a three-year payback, three to five year if because we're good. Longer term capital means I'll never get my money back. That's what it means. You have the risk of not getting your money back, correct. The risk goes higher. Well, it means the longer you think I should leave my money there, the less likely it is I'll ever get it back. So of course. It's not like there's some guaranteed return at the end of that. There's year. never a guaranteed return in business. There's, no, there's never a guaranteed return in any business in the world. You could put your money in, in New York for 25 years and, and go bankrupt. So understandably, but for Armenia, we're looking for a longer term, and that's where it creates a little bit of a clash. Now, if there's an investor that wants three to five year returns, and we do have a project or, or a business that can offer that, great. And it works and we create the deal. But we generally, toward, you know, we generally lean towards you know, five, seven. We're trying to push that, that five years a little bit further as much as possible. And a little by little, it's taking a long time, understandably, but little by little, we're going to get there. I have no doubt we're going to get there, though. I'm, uh, I'm convinced. So why has Armenia been successful in the tech sector? Oh, that's a very good question. I think the, they should answer that. What do you guys think? It's easy to export. It's easy to? Export. Export? OK. Any other ideas? We have engineering minded and we have mathematical minded. The people, for sure. And there's a there's a genealogy of applied mathematics in Armenia. Well, there are many centers, like for example, Tumo that mm -hmm. opened, which gives a lot of opportunities for even kids to start at the early age to learn. So it's, it's easier for them to Inf gain. Access to infrastructure. Yeah, I yeah. think. I think they covered it. Do you think those are accidental? No, I think it comes from the genealogy, first of all. Those were the long-term investments. Where did Tumo come from? It wasn't just born like a pyramid. We recovered it from some, you know, we didn't wipe off the sand and there was Tumo. No, somebody came here named Sam Simonian and decided he wanted to invest in Armenia and make Tumo centers. Yeah. And in my opinion, that was not just a long-term investment. That was... Yeah. You know? Yeah. And why? You know, it's Armenia is a weird thing. People who are patriotic, who care, do things that are irrational. Sure. Like that. Sure. The diaspora network helps. I absolutely. I think diaspora network is crucial for any sector. No, I wouldn't highlight IT, IT specifically, but IT, energy, solar, green tech, fintech, anything that you can imagine, the diaspora network always has its place, in my opinion. Without the diaspora network, none of those sectors can grow to the potential that it has because the diaspora network is, well, I always say that when I said the, the, the 
the innovations that Armenians created, they weren't all created here, but they were all created by our nation, by Armenia, by Armenians. So from that perspective, I think uh, as a whole, we are creators, regardless of where you are. So I, I didn't really separate Armenia in that sense. But I agree with you. The problem there is that that would be a diaspora Armenian. But a, the, a lot of the investors aren't Armenian at all. They're just looking for... My, the issue for me is that the, the emotional can go to a certain point. But there's a, there's a glass ceiling to the emotional. If, if ultimately we can't give profits, then that it won't work. And I think we're, we're getting near that ceiling, at least with the Diaspora Network. At least what I'm feeling, I don't know, correct me if I'm wrong. But my, my emotion is that the Diaspora Network is sick and tired of being sick and tired. Diaspora Network was sick and tired until April of this year. Okay. And something yeah. happened. Yeah. Something that no one expected. Yeah. And uh, I think they now realize maybe there's a window of opportunity. And in fact, if we miss it, it could go backwards. Okay. Good for me. As long as it creates interest and trust and brings money into capital into the country. Sounds good. Sounds good. But I don't think it's sufficient. I mean, one of the challenges that we have as the Diaspora Network is to bring large, scalable, not just investors, but more importantly, corporations mm -hmm. to set up uh, their own uh, development centers, their own uh, facilities in Armenia. And we did a pretty good job of that over the previous 15 years. So you see that there are some large companies here. Okay. And in fact, a fair number of so-called failed companies in Armenia were absorbed at those institutions. Yeah. Uh, it's much more difficult to do that now because the labor force has been dispersed into startup, uh, seven startup summit. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, if you look at the most talented and capable people, they think they should just find a partner and start create a startup. They don't think they should get a job. They don't think they should learn a discipline that would give them, you know, a, an income. They think they should be doing uh, Facebook. So it's challenging now for us to bring uh, large companies who think there is access to a, a very capable labor pool. Okay. That labor pool is very hard to bring into jobs anymore. How many how many people from here currently have a job in Armenia? It's not bad. Besides sixty percent. Besides your startup. So they have a day job. Yeah, yeah, like you have a day job, exactly. Yeah? Everybody was about sixty percent. Not bad. Not bad. Not bad. At least from the people here. I mean, not not sample size, understandably. Um, I agree. I agree because you know the unicorns are, are you know far and they're not going after a unicorn is uh, it's messy and uh, it, it's one in a million shot, even more probably. Um, so from that perspective, I agree. I think that everybody should get a job basically in the beginning. You need you need that structure, but then you need to break out if necessary. But the 60% is not a bad number for me. No. So uh, if they're doing it, they have the a day job. I think would be useful is if those who are doing startups imagine their exit strategy in the context of companies who we might bring to Armenia and who might get there by acquiring an Armenian startup. So if we could design... For example? If I could design uh, an Armenian startup and Cisco would be disrupted by whatever they're doing. Or Cisco would be enabled by whatever they're doing. Okay. And that's just one example, but there's a hundred other examples of companies we'd like to bring here. And if we brought them and threw them in and said, okay, let's go hire a bunch of people, chances are it would fail. But if instead we introduced them to three very interesting startups, one which is disruptive, the other which is enabling, the other which is complimentary, and they figured out for fairly short money they could have an exit and we could have a, a team in Armenia. It would be a nice outcome for everybody, including the government. Sure. And I think it would be a way for us to harness this force and turn it into something sustainable. Okay. Otherwise, how? what percentage of startups survive two years? 
No idea. One in a hundred. Okay. Not that because they're doing something bad, it's just that it's a crapshoot. Yeah. It's, you know, it's odds. So, you know, if you want to have a, a hundred failed companies for every one that's successful, it's probably, I think instead, if you're imagining now from the time you're forming this thing, who am I disrupting? Who am I enabling? Whose ecosystem am I in? Who might be interested in exiting me four, five, three years from now? And why couldn't we imagine that now, design that into our plan, so that when that moment comes, we know where to go. Do you guys have an exit strategy? Some Anybody have an exit strategy? Kind of. What's your exit strategy? You know, yeah, we start up is tap tap. Tap tap. Uh, and look, we have a big, it's not a competitor. It is not another market. It's like an Airbnb. So when he will come to Armenia, and will be much more bigger. Uh, it's it's much better to just buy us to exit, uh, or, and don't like create his own. Because we do real research. We make the tour guides, network. We make a lot of uh, networks for provide them to tourists. Yeah, but you're not really disrupting anything. You're just selling. You're selling your infrastructure. Yeah. So that and, assumes and, and this that the exit whoever way. that company is wants to enter this market. Exactly. Yeah. Right. You want to figure out how you can get in their crosshairs in any market, not just in this market. Um, but I think it's, it's at least a starting point. At least he's thinking about it. Good. And he's starting to think in the right direction. And I think if the rest of the group seem to be much more preoccupied with doing the their own thing yeah. and executing what their own product is, rather than thinking about what the next thing is going to be. What about you guys? What's your exit? Uh, we have a potential one. Uh, okay. Uh, because well, our plans are kind of big, yeah, to, to, to degree. Uh, one of the options is uh, for us to be for our product to be purchased by a uh, bank in Georgia, TBC Bank. Um, why, why would the bank buy a blah blah service? <laughs> That's a surprising thing. But well, the story is basically the following one. Their competitors, the Bank of Georgia, actually launched do you, a... Sorry, do you, does everybody know their product? Do you guys know Blah Blah Car? Yeah. Does everybody know? No? Okay, so pitch. Okay, so. <laughs> essentially, uh, if you don't know what Blah Blah Car is, uh, Gamo, our project, is a ride sharing application where drivers and uh, passengers can be, uh, can be connected to travel the, uh, to travel the certain uh, destination that they share. Uh, and in exchange, the passengers compensate the petrol expense to the driver. That's the short version. So, essentially, the story is the following one uh, Bank of Georgia, the competitor of TBC, uh, launched a similar um, uh, app with a similar um, uh, concept behind it. So the uh, employees would uh, ride share each other to the central office. Uh, and TBC, well, it, it was, in the end, it turned out to be a failure because of like mismanagement within the Bank of Georgia itself. But the concept itself was interesting and it actually attracted a lot of interest to the Bank of Georgia as being a progressive thinking bank. TBC was left outside of the competition and uh, it just so happened that we were participating in TBC's startup competition. And well, during our teach, one of the representatives of, representatives of TBC Bank approached us and said, said, "Like, you guys know, we actually like we're thinking about developing this, but we're thinking about developing that just within TBC Bank itself, so all the employees would use it. Well, whatever you say, the idea seems to be much cooler. But we want to see if it works. So we're gonna like say what. Once the product reached the MVP stage, and once when you reach like a few thousand uh, users, come back to us, and maybe we're gonna purchase you uh, to show off." to like shove in the face of TBC or back in Georgia. That's one potential. Okay. The other one, which is rather, it's, it's rather vague, but still, I mean, I mentioned Blah Blah Car doing our teach. I mean, if you know what Blah Blah Car is, if you don't, um, it's essentially one of the first ride sharing applications, but it's quite a basic one. Their usual entry strategy is uh, to purchase the existing uh, apps within the market. So what they do is mm -hmm. actually they're purchasing the, purchasing the users, not the app itself. Mm -hmm. And that's how they enter it. They don't actually bother. What happened in Georgia... It's the same as he was saying. Basically, they're buying the infrastructure. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So what happened in Georgia is they realized there's no alternative. Uh, mm -hmm. at all. So they tried to enter it just by themselves. Mm -hmm. Failed completely because it turns out Blah Blah Car doesn't have, especially have like experience of entering market on their own. So mm -hmm. there was total mismanagement, no marketing campaign whatsoever, like no one. And they quickly exited the market anyway. 
the fact that they at least attempted to enter it gives us a hope that maybe, if it comes to that, we might be considered as an option for Flabla to enter it through us. Okay. How many how many people startups? How many people have have you have actually pitched and gotten money as a result of the pitch? One. <laughs> two. What'd you pitch? I pitched a new one here, but it was a previous project. Okay. The one we're pitching here is providing dropshipping services on the Shopify platform for Spanish-speaking countries. Okay. That's interesting. Awesome. How many pitches did you do until until you got money the first time? About tens or hundreds, fifteen. How many pitches did you do until you got money? Five in total. But actually, the first one. You're lucky. There's no way. Well, it's surprising, but it was. I'm sure your first pitch was horrible. It was. All first pitches are horrible. It was, but turns out our competitors were, competitors, competitors were even worse. <laughs> <laughs> but, well, we raised it from Tech Park, Georgia. It was a competition? There was. Well, no, was it, a, was it like a oh, yeah, it prize a, money? Yeah, okay. yeah, it was a prize money. But basically an accelerator project with uh, about five startups for one place. Uh, so we, it was our, our first experience, our first designs, our first pitch each. We went there, we got a place, surprisingly, got our first 2,000 for that. A few failed ones after that, and then a success, another failure, and about six months does this one. So okay, let's we'll see, see how it goes. <laughs> All right. So, uh, who has the who has a horror story about pitching, like the worst pitch ever? <laughs> Go ahead. Somebody share their worst pitch. I'm sure you all have one. I just wanted to hear it. <laughs> Share. <laughs> so you've never had a bad pitch? <laughs> it looks you look very cocky. You're like, no, no. All of our pitches were good. Nailed all of them. But you should. But you should. You should constantly talk about it. You should make it into an anecdote. You just thought you could talk about it. You should laugh about it. Yeah. Because it'll it'll teach you what you shouldn't be doing. Yeah, you can learn from that, like an experience. You should remember it. That's my point. Because from that you will learn. You will never make the same mistake again. Yes, we learn from it, and we don't want to remember it again. It's like. Why are we keep on talking about genocide? It's like it's like the it's like the five stages of acceptance, right? You start with denial, and you go to acceptance. Yeah. If you've reached acceptance of your bad pitch, then you should openly talk about it and laugh about it. If you haven't, then you're you're not there yet. You understand what I mean? Own it, own it. And that's one of the other things that I want to mention. Again, during the jury session, a lot of the companies that were pitching, I was, I, we would give feedback, and they would get, you know, f visually I can see them getting frustrated and angry. That's a put off for an investor directly. It's gone. Once once you do that, it's a put off for the investor, because they the investor wants to see that you're. I mean, I've talked to a lot of VCs, and, and it was interesting that the majority, and Berg, back me up on this, but the majority is willing to put money into the team and not the idea. The team is priority. I mean, it's, they, I, I've been literally told that I'm willing to put money into an A team with a B idea rather than a B team with an A idea. They prefer A teams with B ideas versus the, the opposite. And that's specifically because the teams are able to understand, learn, evolve. You know that when you start a startup, by the time it, it becomes something else, it, it changes a lot. 
a lot of things change in between, a lot of things evolve and, and the monetization process becomes different. And you get a shareholder and the shareholder says, no, I, I want more money or boost the margin or do this or cash flow at such. So there's a lot of things that are gonna happen, but if you're, not, if you're not open and willing to change, then you're not gonna make it. You're gonna be part of that 99% that drops out in the first two years. Because basically it's like, it's the you know, jungle law. Jungle law is, it's not whoever's stronger, it's whoever adapts the quickest. And that's the reality. The faster you adapt, the faster you'll be successful. But that's a signal to the investor. If investor is telling you something and you get agitated or you become defensive, it's a signal to the investor that you're not you're not ready to be. You're not mature enough to just have a discussion with an investor because they might want to change a lot of things. And you might not agree, but you have to be mature enough to have an open discussion about it with them. Hear them out understand their, their needs, understand why they're saying that, understand the reason, the motivation for them, and then move forward and then you try to explain. But once you get defensive, it's over. At that moment, you've lost. You lost the pitch. As soon as you get defensive, you lost the pitch. And that's another thing that a lot of the startups did. And even to a point where it, the pitching was done and I left the tent and five startups just jumped on me and said, no, but I did, I was jumping. I'm like, relax, everybody relax, everybody calm down, everybody relax. But I completely disagree. You can't do that. That's not acceptable. Own your mistake. And if you own your mistake, then you should be able to openly discuss it, in my opinion, at least. I can tell you a lot of pitches that I did that went horribly wrong. Horribly, horribly wrong. Okay, so one of my, my worst pitches was, it was an, it was an Armenian company. And, uh, and I, I, I didn't do my preparation as I should have. And I'll accept that. I wasn't as prepared. To be honest, I thought because it's a smaller market, I'll just wing it. Because I would never do that with a bigger multinational client like Carlsberg or Coke or et cetera, right? I thought it was a small Armenian company, what's the worst that can happen? I'll wing it. And I didn't do my prep work. I did my preparation for the company, but I didn't do my preparation for the CEO, his personal preparation. So I wasn't aware of a lot of the things that, that in, his, in his lifestyle and how, who he is. And it turns out he's very religious. He has a very heavy, you know, religious aspect within his family, within him, and uh, and my case study was about was about <laughs> a casino. That did not go well at all, at all. <laughs> Everything I said was right, but as soon as I started talking about the casino, I just see like they're they're just kind of getting angrier and angrier. But I'm not I'm not receiving the signals, so I keep pushing and I keep pushing and I keep pushing, and at one point he's like. He, t he actually stopped me and asked me if I have a gambling problem. <laughs> he said, do you have a gang gambling problem? I'm like, no, this is a case study. I'm like, ah, oh, shit, this one just, I, lo I, I lost the client even before I started. As soon as I said casino, it was, it was over. Um, but I didn't get the signal and that was because of preparation. So I don't make that same mistake. Even it if it's- not have been preparation as much as your ability to read what was going on when you were saying, because you could have you know, turned, it, turned it around quickly if you figured out he was religious and he didn't like casinos. Yeah, but I didn't know, I didn't understand why he didn't like that. I, I was getting the signal that he wasn't engaged in the case study, but I couldn't figure out why. And the why, the motivation behind it was the prep work that I didn't do. Because if I knew he was religious, I would have, I still might have shown the casino because there's different levels of religion and different, you know, but at least I would have quickly understood why the signal is happening. I would change the topic to another because my second case study was beer. It wasn't better. <laughs> so I had a casino. I had beer. It was just the worst possible <laughs> slide deck I could have prepared for that specific meeting. And I didn't do my homework and I, and I lost the clients. And I don't think I'm ever going to get him back again. <laughs> he thinks I'm, I have a gambling problem. So I think it's over from that point on. Not to mention, I didn't show him the beer. <laughs> Thank God I didn't get there. Thank God. He stopped me on the casino, so I didn't even get to the beer case study. So I, I, I got lucky. Uh, at least I only have a gambling problem in his mind. Um, but it really, it really went horribly, horribly wrong. And it was, it was just not, not acceptable. I think I, I hold myself accountable for that. Because it was such an easy pitch. I could have, it was, it was done. I had the right person open the right door, introduce me to the right person. I had the reference and I met the CEO directly. So I had the decision maker, I had the right reference to the right person. I just had to close the deal basically. And, uh, and I blew it. And, and, and until today, I remember that. So I do my preparation work much, 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 much better now. Much, much better. I go into the personal detail of that person to, to a level of detail that 
we I gave we were giving presents at Davos and each present is individualized to that person's specific need base and it was so so clearly to the point that they were actually amazed they, they were they I had somebody say wow how do you know that I mean we had teams sitting and literally watching every single interview that person gave for the last two years all of them and we took notes so we know exactly what's his hot button topic who he is what he does that's how you pitch that's how you prepare i mean you prepare for two months and you pitch for five minutes that's the deal right and you have to customize it yeah i think i'm actually report one now go ahead and it actually happened i mean yeah it happened yesterday no. <laughs> <laughs> this is great yeah. uh, this just didn't really come to mind but what happened was basically uh so we were practicing yesterday pitching like going through our uh, slides just like agreeing on what, what's going to be going to say what not and actually you came up to us and uh, told us that granatus uh, investors want to meet us yesterday like when we asked okay that, like in 10 minutes now. any granatus investors here <laughs> you're safe go ahead <laughs> <laughs> so like, you can't, like when like yeah in 10 minutes so we had the panic attack for a second like are we ready actually like then we're like all right like we practiced we've done everything so we went there there are like seven more startups and i'm pretty sure some of you were there at least like it seems like it um, so anyway uh our team came in and we were the last ones to pitch uh and we used the same slides as here similar to pitch uh it started up reasonably well the video they loved it and then after the video it just went downhill as soon as I started talking about the business model, they just went down on their phones. And like, I had this internal panic of a sort, because like, I realized I knew nothing about them. Even though I met and talked to one of yeah. them just about like two hours before, uh, I didn't actually bother to research anything about him at all. And okay. I realized like I, the, the mistake I made at that point. And like, since I had no backup plan, plan I just went on with my pitch and like, I realized like, it was just a desperate situation at that point. I knew I, had, I knew I had two more minutes and I just kept talking, just realizing that every second was more desperate than the last one. And in the end, it was just awkward silence and they're like, any questions? No. There was complete silence and they're like, we just tired. Like, <laughs> we just yeah, you lost them. Yeah, yeah you I definitely lost the them. Moment, like, yeah, yeah, you lost them. <laughs> okay. Oh, God. So let's go a little bit back. So we that is harsh. About, <laughs> we talk about teams. I want to know how did you know which is like a perfect team, which is like a bad team? Good, good question. So, uh, there, first of all, there's no perfect team, um, and there's no bad team. It's just a matter of ultimately, it's it's. Um, it, I mean, if you have to go back into like a theory of management, but if you go back into theory of management, the idea is that the investor is giving their money to the manager to invest, right? So I'm trusting you with my money, basically, and I'm trusting that you're going to manage it best. So what, what I, I mean, this is, I think this is, and again, Bash, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's very subjective. I think every investor has their own sort of way of looking at teams. I can give you my criteria. What I'm looking for, number one, is I'm looking for the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial spirit, but it's the spirits are not the right word. I'm looking for sharks. I'm looking for people who are willing to fight and, and, and then the, the determination. That's what I'm looking for. Somebody that they believe so much in what their, their product is, they believe so much in what they're doing that it doesn't, basically what they're telling me is that you give me money or not, this is going to happen and it's going to be successful. Now, if you want to join, please, if you don't, go fuck yourself. <laughs> but that's the idea I'm looking for. I'm looking for somebody that's going to come in and they believe in their product. So there's a lot of passion that comes through. If you really love what you do, it comes through in, in the pitch. If you're just pitching it for money, you can tell. If you're pitching it through passion, it's a completely different emotion and you can feel it. Um, the second thing I'm looking for is leadership quality. I'm looking for leadership. And the leader, part of leadership is accepting your mistakes. A part of leadership is the maturity to accept when you made a mistake or you went wrong. The lead, uh, you know, a good leader is, is somebody that, first of all, a good leader breeds leaders. That's one thing also. Like, yeah, so if it's a team that's present, I look at the team dynamic. So there's not just one person kind of autocratically doing all the work or autocratically telling what people what to do. I do want, I do, I do look for a leader in the group. So I do want somebody to clearly be the leader of the group because again, I'm looking for management. Um, 
but I'm looking at the fact that he, he gives credit where it's due. Uh, he, he doesn't take credit where it's not due. I know that the team is operating sufficiently within the group dynamic. Um, there are cases where there's four or five people and I don't, I don't really want one of them, let's say. And that creates a situation, you know, creates a complex situation. And, because ultimately you can buy him out. It's not that big of a deal money-wise, but when you buy him out, the rest of the team you know, creates tension within the team and the group dynamic shifts, etc. cetera. The, the other thing I'm looking for, and this is, I think for me, is the, one of the most important, is I want to understand that, you have to understand that there's, there's ultimately a, an area where the creator of the product and the person that, WineNet, is WineNet here? No, so WineNet was one of the pitches for me. Uh, the guy, the creator, is it's a wine app, whatever, etc. But he's he's a wine connoisseur. He loves wine, and that's why he created it. It's great. It looked more like a hobby than a business, but it can be monetized. I believe that his product can be monetized, but it can only be monetized if he steps down as CEO. He can't be the CEO of that company because he's not a businessman. You get my gist? So the other part is I'm looking for leadership qualities and maturity in the sense that. You understand that you can, you might be able to build it to 10,000 users or 100,000 users, but at one point it might get to a situation where you just don't have the skill set required to take it to the next level and grow it to you know that market. And at that point, will you be willing to step down as CEO and remain a shareholder? I think that's one of the other crucial points that I usually look at, and I think it's more leadership and maturity that that. I mean, you can when you're talking to someone, you can tell that it's a, there's a business mindset there. That if they step down but they make more money, they're willing to do so. And that's sort of the, the other part of it that I look at. Is that what you want to but weigh it, in? It's often the case that the founders and the team that creates a company is not very good at raising money. Yeah. Uh, and certainly not very good at pitching. Um, we had a bunch of groups ourselves we were mentoring. Mm -hmm. And I felt bad that couple of them were the core, let's say, technical and scientific, you know, minds behind this thing, and we're teaching them how to make slides. Why are we forcing them into the mold of slide making? Yeah. And they really should be the ones who are inventing the, the, the product cap capability yeah. itself. And, okay, I acknowledge that, I say, so uh, let's, let's say it's important for them to know how to pitch. Okay, good. Now they pitch. Um, normally what an investor would do as a result of putting money in is they would put somebody in there yeah. who's got complementary skills that they've selected or they've recommended and they choose somebody who's got different functional capabilities and contributes to the group. So I'm, I'm willing to kind of look past a bad pitch sometimes. Okay. If I think if I think what they're working on is worthy and, and it's fine, the, the fact that they didn't pitch that well would mm -hmm. not be what's critical about their success or not. Okay. But you've got to you've got to then still be able to communicate why it's that way. Why why should I believe in it anyway? Even though the pitch didn't go that well. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Idea. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. Now you want to you want to convince me that's what happens? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> okay. Questions? Anybody want to weigh in? Yeah. 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 Okay. We've had met, ID, uh, have had chances to do um, a spontaneous pitch, to do a spontaneous, spontaneous um, elevator pitch for um, to an investor, and we know that we've got a problem there. Yeah. It's not your fault. Yeah. We're trying to to, to prove that yeah. that it could be actually solved. It's just a matter of time. Okay. Yeah, you definitely tell them. I mean, am I going to be honest? Yes, definitely. Absolutely. Own it. Own it. Own it. If you own it, it's better for the investor. If you try to hide it, he's going to find it. That's my point. If, if you have a weak point and there's a chink in the armor, the investor is going to see it. They're going to find it. And if you don't own it up front, 
then they're going to think that you didn't see it, which creates a whole doubt about your team and how you operate. But let me ask you a question. Before that elevator pitch happened, how many times did you tell your friends, your family, the story of your startup? How many times? Yeah. I rather uh, was insecure about the worst part. Okay. That was not as bad as it actually is. Okay. So basically, it, it actually stopped me from doing the, the, the perfect one minute pitch. Yeah. That could, be, um, that could easily avoid the problem. You, you don't avoid the problem, own the problem, own it. Right. Identify and say, here's a, you have to. Because again, the, the investor is going to find the problem. And if they find it on their own, you're going to have a bigger problem than if you own it. So at that point, the best is cut your losses and own own the own the problem. So here's the issue that we have. Okay. I would say you know we've accomplished this, we've developed that, and we have all these things done. But the missing piece of our solution is this. Is this? Yeah. And the reason why we're trying to raise money is to be able to attack that problem and make it part of our overall, uh, let's say, best of breed or whatever it is, and identify the fact that there's a missing piece or there's a flaw and then say, that's why I need your help. That's why your contribution would make, have helped me overcome it. I guess that's, that's the main problem in my head. Do, do I consider an investor as someone who helped me or do I consider him that I need to pre pre present something perfect? <laughs> I understand what you mean, both. The investor is going to be both your shareholder and your mentor, basically. But you need to get some sort of synergy there. So it's OK to say that, just like Bert said, you know, I, the, I'm 80% there, I need $20,000 for the other 20%. And ultimately, you're going to get this 100% solution. That's basically what he was saying. That's a good pitch. But it's okay to own, them, own the, the shortfall. Because again, if you don't, they're going to find it. There's no reason not to. Guys, any questions? Hi. Yeah, hi. Yeah. Um, how about... Uh, a lot of our friends are uh, making uh, the, uh, apps like uh, on cryptocurrencies and the blockchain. So uh, when they ask investors about the, the, when they pitch to investors, uh, investors are high, uh, kind of uh, look for presentations like, like complex uh, ones. So they kind of don't understand it. That way. Yeah. So uh, what do they can um, they must do to make the simpler? So. I can't, I can't speak specifically about fintech pitches because I, I don't have experience in that field, to be honest. Uh, I can give you more of a global overview of what I usually do when it comes to complicated issues. So uh, if we have a, what we did in our consulting from a lot of it was, was running big data and you know, marketing big data and then coming up with you know, segments, marketing strategies, et cetera, et cetera. So like a whole, and, and big data was something that was talked about a lot. But when you sit down with the chief marketing officer of Danone, they don't really know or they don't know it to the detail that I do to explain. So it, it, sort of the same problem happens. My, my solution is so sophisticated that it's very complex to explain in a very simple way. Um, the first thing I'll tell you is that uh, Churchill has a great quote. He said, if I had more time, I would write a shorter speech. It's very difficult to package complex issues into simple so spend more time on on trying to oversimplifying it to a point where it becomes a minute and it becomes easy to explain the second thing is use a lot of examples uh, I'll give you I'll give you an example <laughs> uh, you were just when when I said do you know and they said no pitch and you pitched it and you the, you explained it it was okay I'm sure everybody here 80 percent got it 80 20 but if you want hundred percent to get it you say for example if you want to go from Sevan Startup to Yerevan and there's somebody going anyway, then you put the app on you and you go and, you, and then you give them a dollar for petrol. That would just, and done. But again, that's why if you do it, and this is our strategy, you don't have to use it. Our strategy was always two people. One was doing play-by-play -play and one was doing color commentary. So the guy doing play-by-play -play -play is basically a number sort of, uh, more analytical brain, more analytical talk, it's a lot of numbers and databases and things like that. And then we had color commentary that would just bring examples and color f and the story and it would nail home because 
you can see from their faces that they, they kind of don't get it. Like, they kind of get it, but they kind of don't get it. And then the color commentary guy would pop in and say, give an example, like, da 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 da, da. for example, la 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 la. And, oh, okay, we got it. And then, and then the play by play guy takes over again and keeps going. You get what I mean? Yeah. And it's not just this awkward where I go, okay, so slide one to four is me, slide five to six is you, then pass it back to me for seven, and I pass it back to him on eight, nine, and ten, and then you finish off with eleven. Because that's what I'm sure you do. <laughs> and you shouldn't. Because you're you're breaking apart the story. Let one person just take the whole thing through, and then one person just adds sprinkles and makes it more colorful and light. You get what I mean? Now, again, this is our strategy. You don't have to use it, but the roles of the... If you have four people standing, they have to have a role. If they're not adding value, they should be sitting. It's very straightforward. Because if they're standing there and he says nothing, the problem with that is then, for me, he's you don't have a good team. Because he stood there and he didn't add value, so why do you need this person? I'm sure you need him. But if he's not adding value to that specific case talking to me, then he needs to be sitting down or in the background somewhere. I don't need to see him. Make sense? But you, you want to make sure you have roles. and then Or good cop, bad cop. That's the other option that we, that we usually... I know it's classic, but that's, we also run that. You know, consulting is a little bit complicated. It's like, it's like, it is like startups, by the way. It's like pitching. Because ultimately, I'm walking into a place where they already have the whole business model ready to go. I need to convince them that they don't know what they're doing and I have a better solution than they do, right? So I have to, there has to be an area where we have to say, you, you're wrong. <laughs> Basically, there's a point where you have to say, you're making a mistake. This is what you shouldn't be doing. You should be doing this. And that's where good cop, bad cop comes into play. So somebody would just go run it through and somebody would jump in and say, you have no idea what you're doing. It's complete crap. This is a better solution. And he would jump in and start, you know, and stuff like that. But Whoever's talking, you have to agree on the roles beforehand. So you always do this, I always do this, I'm going to run it this way, you run it this way. And then always pitch the same people over and over again. Because it creates chemistry. You know what I mean? It, it, there's a lot of... So, again, I'll give you an example. I, I'm, I'm American-Armenian. I usually would pitch with an Italian. He was my pitching partner. And we were very good together. Or, or a Norwegian. So three partners. There, there's about seven partners in the firm. But those three would be our sort of unit that we would pitch together. And with the Norwegian and Italian and American Armenian. So what we did is we, we stereotyped ourselves. We stereotype ourselves because it becomes more human to the person in front. We do it on purpose. Like me as an, uh, sort of the American, I would always be more optimistic. And I would say, you know, fuck, shit, dick a lot. <laughs> and I can get away with it. I can get away with it. Because I have that American side. A Norwegian cannot get away with it. If a Norwegian says one cuss word, it's, it's going to create such a clash in their head that they're not going to understand why this person is saying those words. But I can get away with it because I have that American side when you pitch. Plus, it creates like a little you know, shock effect for a moment. Um, the Norwegian was always the nice, you know, the socialist. Everybody needs to play nice with everybody. And, you know, and, and he completely would play into that role. And the Italian, of course, was the womanizer, right? So the girls and... Hey, oh, hey, you know, like that kind of thing. It was perfect. It was perfect. It was the best thing we've ever seen. And it was great because he would make fun of me for being American. I would make fun of him for being Italian. And he would make fun of the other one for being Norwegian. And it broke the ice. Because when, you're, when we're allowed to you know, play off of each other like that, then everybody in the room calms down. The tension is gone. And then you get that human connection that you're looking for. So it takes, so I shouldn't be saying this, they're going to put this on air and then my clients are going to run away, but, but you get that human connection that, that you're looking for. Um, but you want to play into the roles. So it's okay to be stereotypical because then you're remembered. You get what I mean? Like people remember you for being that type of person or that type of person or that type of person. And it's, and, and, and you have, but you have to play into your own actual core of who you are. I'm, I'm American Armenian. I, I talk with my hands and I do this and I'm like that anyway. I just turn up the volume on it when I pitch, right? And Italian, you know, the girls anyway, he just turns up the volume when he pitches so that we can play off of each other. And they remember us. It's stereotypical that they would say the American, the Italian, and Norwegian. That's fine. It doesn't have to be, you know, based on the country. It could be based on whatever, but you want to give, you want to have a profile of who you are in, in that pitch. Does that make sense? We have to run. The, yeah, it's at nine, right? We have three minutes. We have three minutes. And last question. Last question. Okay. <laughs> uh, 
uh, you talked about uh, big data and marketing. Uh, so I'm gonna interested in that field Good. and uh, can you please share with us uh, about what type of data you are collecting and uh, how do you use uh, in marketing? Uh, no. No? No, I can't. That's proprietary. Okay. I, I would have to literally ask all of the partners to be okay with it before I tell you. Okay. Um, and I can't, I can't share that. I'm sorry. The, the partners were proprietary. Okay. Okay then. Sorry, <laughs> I would love to, but sorry. Uh, take take uh, one of the even classes. Even in uh, big picture, um, I, I teach a class at AUA. I teach the MBA and the MBA course at AUA. Mm -hmm. Talk to me. Maybe we can set up a situation where you audit the class, because a lot of what I cover during the class is a lot of the the methodologies of how we run our our, our methodology. Okay. Make sense? Somehow. <laughs> okay. I, that's, that's all I can do. Let me put it that way. I can't do anything more at this point. Good. Okay, thank you, thank very, you much. very much, guys. I appreciate thank it. Thanks. Great.